Chapter 2 The New Orphan Houses, Ashley Down A complaint having been received from a gentleman in October 1845 that some of the inhabitants of Wilson Street were inconvenienced by the orphan houses being in that street, Mr. Muller ultimately decided, for that and other reasons, after much prayerful meditation, to build an orphan house elsewhere, to accommodate three hundred children, and commenced to ask the Lord for means for so doing. January the 31st, 1846. It is now eighty-nine days since I have been daily waiting upon God about the building of an orphan house. The time seems to me now near when the Lord will give us a piece of ground, and I told the brethren and sisters so this evening, after our usual Saturday evening prayer meeting at the orphan houses. February the 1st. A poor widow sent to-day ten shillings. February the 2nd. To-day I heard of suitable and cheap land on Ashley Down. February the 3rd. Saw the land. It is the most desirable of all I have seen. There was anonymously put in an orphan box at my house a sovereign, in a piece of paper on which was written, The New Orphan House. February the 4th. This evening I called on the owner of the land on Ashley Down, about which I had heard on the second, but he was not at home. As I, however, had been informed that I should find him at his house of business, I went there, but did not find him there either, as he had just before left. I might have called again at his residence at a later hour, having been informed by one of the servants that he would be sure to be at home about eight o'clock, but I did not do so judging that there was the hand of God in my not finding him at either place, and I judged it best therefore not to force the matter, but to let patience have her perfect work. February the 5th. I saw this morning the owner of the land. He told me that he awoke at three o'clock this morning, and could not sleep again till five. While he was thus lying awake, his mind was all the time occupied about the piece of land, respecting which inquiry had been made of him for the building of an orphan-house at my request, and he determined that if I should apply for it, he would not only let me have it, but for a hundred and twenty pounds per acre, instead of two hundred pounds, the price which he had previously asked for it. How good is the Lord! The agreement was made this morning, and I purchased a field of nearly seven acres at a hundred and twenty pounds per acre. Observe the hand of God in my not finding the owner at home last evening. The Lord meant to speak to his servant first about this matter during a sleepless night, and to lead him fully to decide before I had seen him. Because of his importunity. November the 19th, 1846. I am now led more and more to importune the Lord to send me the means which are requisite in order that I may be able to commence the building. Because, one, it has been for some time past publicly stated in print, that I allow it is not without ground that some of the inhabitants of Wilson Street consider themselves inconvenienced by the orphan houses being in that street, and I long therefore to be able to remove the orphans from thence as soon as possible. Two, I became more and more convinced that it would be greatly for the benefit of the children, both physically and morally, with God's blessing, to be in such a position as they are intended to occupy when the new orphan-house should have been built. And three, because the number of very poor and destitute orphans that are waiting for admission is so great, and there are constantly fresh applications made. Now whilst, by God's grace, I would not wish the building to be begun one single day sooner than is his will, and whilst I firmly believe that he will give me in his own time every shilling which I need, yet I also know that he delights in being earnestly entreated, and that he takes pleasure in the continuance in prayer, and in the importuning him, which so clearly is to be seen from the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. For these reasons, I gave myself again particularly to prayer last evening, that the Lord would send further means, 
being also especially led to do so, in addition to the above reasons, because there had come in but little comparatively since the twenty-ninth of last month. This morning, between five and six o'clock, I prayed again, among other points, about the building fund, and then had a long season for the reading of the word of God. In the course of my reading, I came to Mark 11, verse 24. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall receive them. The importance of the truth contained in this portion I have often felt and spoken about, but this morning I felt it again most particularly, and, applying it to the new orphan house, said to the Lord, Lord, I believe that Thou wilt give me all I need for this work. I am sure that I shall have all, because I believe that I receive, in answer to my prayer. Thus, with my heart full of peace concerning this work, I went on to the other part of the chapter, and to the next chapter. After family prayer, I had again my usual season for prayer with regard to all the many parts of the work, and the various necessities thereof, asking also blessings upon my fellow labourers, upon the circulation of Bibles and tracts, and upon the precious souls in the adult school, the Sunday schools, the six-day schools, and the four orphan houses. Amidst all the many things, I again made my requests about means for the building. And now observe, about five minutes after I had risen from my knees, there was given to me a registered letter, containing a cheque for three hundred pounds, of which two hundred and eighty pounds are for the building fund, ten for my own personal expenses, and ten pounds for Brother Craik. The Lord's holy name be praised for this precious encouragement, by which the building fund is now increased to more than six thousand pounds. Mr. Muller's First Orphan House January the 25th, 1847 The season of the year is now approaching when building may be begun. Therefore, with increased earnestness, I have given myself unto prayer, importuning the Lord that he would be pleased to appear on our behalf, and speedily send the remainder of the amount which is required. And I have increasingly of late felt that the time is drawing near when the Lord will give me all that which is requisite for commencing the building. All the various arguments which I have often brought before God, I brought also again this morning before Him. It is now fourteen months and three weeks since day by day I have uttered my petitions to God on behalf of this work. I rose from my knees this morning in full confidence, not only that God could, but also would send the means, and that soon. Never, during all these fourteen months and three weeks, have I had the least doubt that I should have all that which is requisite. And now, dear believing reader, rejoice and praise with me. About an hour after I had prayed thus, there was given to me the sum of two thousand pounds for the building fund. Thus I have received altogether nine thousand two hundred and eighty-five pounds, three shillings, and nine and a half pence, towards this work. I cannot describe the joy I had in God when I received this donation. It must be known from experience in order to be felt. Four hundred and forty-seven days... I have had day by day to wait upon God, before the sum reached the above amount. How great is the blessing which the soul obtains by trusting in God and by waiting patiently! Is it not manifest how precious it is to carry on God's work in this way, even with regard to the obtaining of means? The total amount which came in for the building fund was fifteen thousand seven hundred and eighty four pounds. 18 shillings and 10 pence. Orphan Houses Numbers 2 and 3 March the 12th, 1862 It was November 1850 that my mind became exercised about enlarging the orphan work from 300 orphans to 1,000 and subsequently to 1,150 and it was in June 1851 that this my purpose became known having kept it secret for more than seven months, whilst day by day praying about it. 
From the end of November 1850 to this day, March the 12th, 1862, not one single day has been allowed to pass without this contemplated enlargement being brought before God in prayer, and generally more than once a day. But only now, this day, the new orphan house number three was so far advanced that it could be opened. Observe then first, esteemed reader, how long it may be before a full answer to our prayers, even to thousands and tens of thousands of prayers, is granted. Yea, though those prayers may be believing prayers, earnest prayers, and offered up in the name of the Lord Jesus, and though we may only for the sake of the honour of our Lord desire the answer, for I did, by the grace of God, without the least doubt and wavering, look for more than eleven years for the full answer, and I sought only in this matter the glory of God. Praying three times daily for helpers. As in the case of number two, so also in the case of the new orphan house number three, I had daily prayed for the needed helpers and assistants for the various departments. Before a stone was laid, I began to pray for this and as the building progressed, I continued day by day to bring this matter before God, feeling assured that, as in everything else, so in this particular also, He would graciously be pleased to appear on our behalf and help us, as the whole work is intended for His honour and glory. At last the time was near when the house could be opened, and the time therefore near when the applications which had been made in writing during more than two years previously should be considered for the filling up of the various posts. It now, however, was found that, whilst there had been about fifty applications made for the various situations, some places could not be filled up, because either the individuals who had applied for them were married, or were on examination found unsuitable. This was no small trial of faith, for day by day, for years, had I asked God to help me in this matter, even as he had done in the case of the new orphan house number two. I had also expected help, confidently expected help, and yet now, when help seemed needed, it was wanting. What was now to be done, dear reader? Would it have been right to charge God with unfaithfulness? Would it have been right to distrust him? Would it have been right to say, it is useless to pray? By no means. This, on the contrary, I did. I thanked God for all the help He had given me in connection with the whole of the enlargement. I thanked Him for enabling me to overcome so many and such great difficulties. I thanked Him for the helpers He had given me for number two. I thanked Him also for the helpers He had given me already for number three. And instead of distrusting God, I looked upon this delay of the full answer to prayer only as a trial of faith and therefore resolved that, instead of praying once a day with my dear wife about this matter, as we had been doing day by day for years, we should now meet daily three times to bring this before God. I also brought the matter before the whole staff of my helpers in the work requesting their prayers. Thus I have now continued for about four months longer in prayer, day by day calling upon God three times on account of this need, and the result has been that one helper after the other has been given, without the help coming too late, or the work getting into confusion, or the reception of the children being hindered. And I am fully assured that the few who are yet needed will also be found when they are really required. Difficulties removed after prayer and patience. Mr. Muller relates the following incidents in connection with the purchase of the land for the fourth and fifth orphan houses, after receiving five thousand pounds for the building fund. I had now, through all that had come in since May the 26th, 1864, including this last mentioned donation, about twenty-seven thousand pounds in hand. I had patiently waited God's time. I had determined to do nothing until I had the full half of the sum needed for the two houses. But now, having above two thousand pounds beyond the half, I felt, after again seeking counsel from God, 
quite happy in taking steps for the purchase of land. My eyes had been for years directed to a beautiful piece of land, only separated by the turnpike road from the ground on which the new orphan house number three is erected. The land is about eighteen acres, with a small house and outhouses built on one end thereof. Hundreds of times had I prayed within the last years that God, for Jesus' sake, would count me worthy to be allowed to erect on this ground two more orphan houses. And hundreds of times I had with a prayerful eye looked on this land, yea, as it were, bedewed it with my prayers. I might have bought it years ago, but that would have been going before the Lord. I had money enough in hand to have paid for it years ago, but I desired patiently, submissively, to wait God's own time, and for Him to mark it clearly and distinctly that His time was come, and that I took the step according to His will. For whatever I might apparently accomplish, if the work were mine and not the Lord's, I could expect no blessing. But now the Lord's mind was clearly and distinctly made manifest. I had enough money in hand to pay for the land and to build one house, and therefore I went forward, after having still asked the Lord for guidance, and being assured that it was His will I should take active steps. The first thing I did was to see the agent who acted for the owner of the land, and to ask him whether the land was for sale. He replied that it was, but that it was let till March the 25th, 1867. He said that he would write for the price. Here a great difficulty at once presented itself, that the land was let for two years and four months longer, whilst it appeared desirable that I should be able to take possession of it in about six months, viz. as soon as the conveyance could be made out and the plans be ready for the new orphan house number four, and arrangements be made with contractors. But I was not discouraged by this difficulty, for I expected, through prayer, to make happy and satisfactory arrangements with the tenant, being willing to give him a fair compensation for leaving before his time had expired. But before I had time to see about this, two other great difficulties presented themselves. The one was that the owner asked seven thousand pounds for the land, which I judged to be considerably more than its value, and the other that I heard that the Bristol Waterworks Company intended to make an additional reservoir for their water on this very land, and to get an act of Parliament passed to that effect. Pause here for a few moments, esteemed reader. You have seen how the Lord brought me so far, with regard to pecuniary means, that I felt now warranted to go forward, and I may further add that I was brought to this point as the result of thousands of times praying regarding this object, and that there were also many hundreds of children waiting for admission, and yet, after the Lord Himself so manifestly had appeared on our behalf, by the donation of five thousand pounds, He allows this apparent death-blow to come upon the whole. But thus I have found it hundreds of times since I have known the Lord. The difficulties which He is pleased to allow to arise are only allowed, under such circumstances, for the exercise of our faith and patience. And more prayer, more patience, and the exercise of faith will remove the difficulties. Now, as I knew the Lord, these difficulties were no insurmountable difficulties to me, for I put my trust in Him, according to that word, The Lord will also be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10. I gave myself, therefore, earnestly to prayer concerning all these three especial difficulties which had arisen regarding the land. I prayed several times daily about the matter, and used the following means. 1. I saw the acting committee of the directors of the Bristol Waterworks Company regarding their intended reservoir on the land which I was about to purchase, and stated to them what I had seen in print concerning their intentions. They courteously stated to me 
that only a small portion of the land would be required, not enough to interfere with my purpose, and that, if it could be avoided, even this small portion should not be taken. 2. This being settled, I now saw the tenant, after many prayers, for I desired, as a Christian, that if this land were bought, it should be done under amicable circumstances with regard to him. At the first interview, I stated my intentions to him, at the same time expressing my desire that the matter should be settled pleasantly with regard to himself. He said that he would consider the matter, and desired a few days for that purpose. After a week I saw him again, and he then kindly stated that, as the land was wanted for such an object, he would not stand in the way, but that, as he had laid out a good deal on the house and land, he expected a compensation for leaving it before his time was up, as I, of course, was quite willing to give a fair and reasonable compensation, I consider this a very precious answer to prayer. 3. I now entered upon the third difficulty, the price of the land. I knew well how much the land was worth to the orphan institution, but its value to the institution was not the market value. I gave myself, therefore, day by day to prayer, that the Lord would constrain the owner to accept a considerably lower sum than he had asked. I also pointed out to him why it was not worth as much as he asked. At last he consented to take five thousand five hundred pounds, instead of seven thousand, and I accepted the offer, for I knew that by the level character of the land we should save a considerable sum for the two houses, and that by the new sewer, which only a few months before had been completed, running along under the turnpike road near the field, we should be considerably benefited. In addition to these two points, I had to take into the account that we can have gas from Bristol, as in the three houses already in operation. And lastly, the most important point of all, the nearness of this piece of land to the other three houses, so that all could easily be under the same direction and superintendence. In fact, no other piece of land, near or far off, would present so much advantage to us as this spot, which the Lord thus so very kindly had given to us. All being now settled, I proceeded to have the land conveyed to the same trustees who stood trustees for the new orphan houses numbers 1, 2 and 3. I have thus minutely dwelt on these various matters, for the encouragement of the reader, that he may not be discouraged by difficulties, however great and many and varied, but give himself to prayer, trusting in the Lord for help, yea, expecting help, which in his own time and way he will surely grant. Orphan Houses No. 4 and 5 March the 5th, 1874 both houses, number four and number five, have now been for years in operation. Number four since November 1868, and number five since the beginning of the year 1870, and above 1,200 orphans have been already received into them, and month after month more are received, as the orphans are sent out from them as apprentices or servants. Moreover, all the expenses in connection with their being built, fitted up and furnished, were met to the full as the demands arose, and after all had been paid there was left a balance of several thousand pounds, which is being used for keeping the houses in repair. See, esteemed reader, how abundantly God answered our prayers, and how plain it is that we were not mistaken after we had patiently and prayerfully sought to ascertain His will. Be encouraged, therefore, yet further and further, to confide in the living God. Chapter 3 Precious Answers to Prayer Part 1 In remarkable ways God helped Mr. Muller, as the narratives show. The Artist's First Return April the 30th, 1859 Received the following letter from a considerable distance. My dear Christian brother, I am the husband of Mrs. who sends you by this post the two sovereign peace. How can we better dispose of this relic of affectionate remembrance than by depositing it in the bank of Christ, who always pays the best interest and never fails? 
Now, my best and spiritual counsellor, I cannot express to you the exceeding great joy I feel in relating what follows. I am an artist, a poor artist, a landscape painter. About two weeks ago I sent a picture to Bristol for exhibition, just as I finished your book that was lent us. I most humbly and earnestly prayed to God to enable me, by the sale of my Bristol picture, to have the blessed privilege of sending you half the proceeds. The price of the picture is twenty pounds. Now mark, immediately the exhibition is open, God, in his mercy, mindful of my prayer, sends me a purchaser. I have exhibited in Bristol before, but never sold a picture. Oh, my dear friend, my very heart leaps for joy. I have never been so near God before. Through your instrumentality I have been enabled to draw nearer to God, with more earnestness, more faith, more holy desires. This is the first return God has blessed me with for the whole of my last year's labours. What a blessing to have it so returned! Oh, with what joy I read your book! The picture I speak of is now being exhibited in the Academy of Arts at Clifton, numbered in the catalogue, and the title is I cannot pay you till the close of the exhibition, as I shall not be paid till then, etc. Of such letters I have had thousands during the last forty years. The north wind changed into a south wind. It was towards the end of November 1857, when I was most unexpectedly informed that the boiler of our heating apparatus at number one leaked very considerably, so that it was impossible to go through the winter with such a leak. Our heating apparatus consists of a large cylinder boiler, inside of which the fire is kept, and with which boiler the water pipes that warm the rooms are connected. Hot air is also connected with this apparatus. The boiler had been considered suited for the work of the winter. To suspect that it was worn out, and not to do anything towards replacing it by a new one, and to have said, I will trust in God regarding it, would be careless presumption, but not faith in God. It would be the counterfeit of faith. The boiler is entirely surrounded by brickwork. Its state, therefore, could not be known without taking down the brickwork. This, if needless, would be rather injurious to the boiler than otherwise. And as for eight winters we had had no difficulty in this way, we had not anticipated it now. But suddenly, and most unexpectedly, at the commencement of the winter, this difficulty occurred. What then was to be done? For the children, especially the younger infants, I felt deeply concerned that they might not suffer through want of warmth. But how were we to obtain warmth? The introduction of a new boiler would in all probability take many weeks. The repairing of the boiler was a questionable matter, on account of the greatness of the leak. But if not, nothing could be said of it till the brick chamber in which it is enclosed was, at least in part, removed but that would, at least as far as we could judge, take days. And what was to be done in the meantime, to find warm rooms for three hundred children? It naturally occurred to me to introduce temporary gas stoves, but on further weighing the matter it was found that we should be unable to heat our very large rooms with gas, except we had many stoves, which we could not introduce, as we had not a sufficient quantity of gas to spare from our lighting apparatus. Moreover, for each of these stoves we needed a small chimney to carry off the impure air. This mode of heating, therefore, though applicable to a hall, a staircase, or a shop, would not suit our purpose. I also thought of the temporary introduction of Arnott stoves, but they would have been unsuitable, requiring long chimneys, as they would have been of a temporary kind, to go out of the windows. On this account, the uncertainty of their answering in our case, and the disfigurement of the windows led me to give up this plan also. But what was to be done? Gladly would I have paid a hundred pounds if thereby the difficulty could have been overcome, and the children not be exposed to suffer for many days from being in cold rooms. At last I determined on falling entirely into the hands of God, who is very merciful and of tender compassion and I decided on having the brick chamber opened to see the extent of the damage, and whether the boiler might be repaired, 
so as to carry us through the winter. The day was fixed when the workmen were to come, and all the necessary arrangements were made. The fire, of course, had to be let out while the repairs were going on. But now see, after the day was fixed for the repairs, a bleak north wind set in. It began to blow either on Thursday or Friday, before the Wednesday afternoon, when the fire was to be let out. Now came the first really cold weather which we'd had in the beginning of that winter, during the first days of December. What was to be done? The repairs could not be put off. I now asked the Lord for two things, viz., that he would be pleased to change the north wind into a south wind, and that he would give to the workmen a mind to work. For I remembered how much Nehemiah accomplished in fifty-two days while building the walls of Jerusalem, because the people had a mind to work. Well, the memorable day came. The evening before, the bleak north wind blew still, but on the Wednesday, the south wind blew, exactly as I had prayed. The weather was so mild that no fire was needed. The brickwork is removed, the leak is found out very soon, the boilermakers begin to repair in good earnest. About half-past eight in the evening, when I was going home, I was informed at the lodge that the acting principal of the firm whence the boilermakers came had arrived to see how the work was going on, and whether he could in any way speed the matter. I went immediately, therefore, into the cellar to see him with the men, to seek to expedite the business. In speaking to the principal of this, he said in their hearing, "'The men will work late this evening, and come very early again to-morrow.' "'We would rather, sir,' said the leader, "'work all night.' Then remembered I the second part of my prayer, that God would give the men a mind to work. Thus it was. By the morning the repair was accomplished, the leak was stopped, though with great difficulty, and within about thirty hours the brickwork was up again, and the fire in the boiler. And all the time the south wind blew so mildly that there was not the least need of a fire. Here, then, is one of our difficulties which was overcome by prayer and faith. Conversion of the Orphans May the 26th, 1860 Day after day, and year after year, by the help of God, we labour in prayer for the spiritual benefit of the orphans under our care. These our supplications, which have been for twenty-four years brought before the Lord concerning them, have been abundantly answered, in former years, in the conversion of hundreds from among them. We have also had repeated seasons in which, within a short time, or even all at once, many of the orphans were converted. Such a season we had about three years since, when, within a few days, about sixty were brought to believe in the Lord Jesus, and such seasons we have had again twice during the first year. The first was in July, 1859, when the Spirit of God wrought so mightily in one school of a hundred and twenty girls, as that very many, yea, more than one half, were brought under deep concern about the salvation of their souls. This work, moreover, was not a mere momentary excitement, but after more than eleven months have passed, there are thirty-one concerning whom there is full confidence as to their conversion, and thirty-two concerning whom there is likewise a goodly measure of confidence, though not to the same amount as regarding the thirty-one. There are therefore sixty-three out of the hundred and twenty orphans in that one school, which are considered to have been converted in July 1859. This blessed and mighty work of the Holy Spirit cannot be traced to any particular cause. It was, however, a most precious answer to prayer. As such we look upon it, and are encouraged by it to further waiting upon God. The second season of the mighty working of the Holy Spirit among the orphans during the past year was at the end of January and the beginning of February, 1860. The particulars of it are of the deepest interest, but I must content myself by stating that this great work of the Spirit of God in January and February, 1860, began among the younger class of the children under our care, little girls of about six, seven, eight, and nine years old, then extended to the older girls, and then to the boys, 
so that within about ten days above two hundred of the orphans were stirred up to be anxious about their souls, and in many instances found peace immediately through faith in our Lord Jesus. They at once requested to be allowed to hold prayer meetings among themselves, and have had these meetings ever since. Many of them also manifested a concern about the salvation of their companions and relations, and spoke or wrote to them about the way to be saved. Apprenticing the Orphans In the early part of the summer, 1862, it was found that we had several boys ready to be apprenticed, but there were no applications made by masters for apprentices. As all our boys are invariably sent out as indoor apprentices, this was no small difficulty, for we not only look for Christian masters, but consider their business and examine into their position to see whether they are suitable, and the master must also be willing to receive the apprentice into his own family. Under these circumstances we again gave ourselves to prayer, as we had done for more than twenty years before concerning this thing, instead of advertising, which in all probability would only bring before us masters who desire apprentices for the sake of the premium. We remembered how good the Lord had been to us, in having helped us hundreds of times before in this very matter. Some weeks passed, but the difficulty remained. We continued, however, in prayer, and then one application was made, and then another. And since we first began to pray about this matter last summer, we have been able to send out altogether eighteen boys, up to May the 26th, 1863. The difficulty was thus again entirely overcome by prayer, as every one of the boys whom it was desirable to send out has been sent out. Sickness at the Orphanage Sickness at times visited the houses. During the summer and autumn of 1866, we had also the measles at all the three orphan houses. After they had made their appearance, our especial prayer was, one, that there might not be too many children ill at one time in this disease, so that our accommodation in the infirmary rooms or otherwise might be sufficient. This prayer was answered to the full, for although we had at the new orphan house number one not less than eighty-three cases, in number two altogether one hundred and eleven, and in number three altogether sixty-eight, yet God so graciously was pleased to listen to our supplications, as that when our spare rooms were filled with the invalids, he so long stayed the spreading of the measles, till a sufficient number were restored, so as to make room for others who were taken ill. 2. Further we prayed that the children who were taken ill in the measles might be safely brought through and not die. Thus it was. We had the full answer to our prayers, for though 262 children altogether had the measles, not one of them died. 3. Lastly, we prayed that no evil physical consequences might follow this disease, as is so often the case. This was also granted. All the 262 children not only recovered, but did well afterwards. I gratefully record this signal mercy and blessing of God, and this full and precious answer to prayer, to the honour of His name. Help for Needy Brethren 1863. The end of the year was now at hand, and in winding up the accounts it was my earnest desire to do once more all I could in sending help to needy labourers in the gospel. I went therefore through the list, writing against the various names of those to whom I had not already recently sent, what amount it appeared desirable to send. And I found, when these sums were added together, the total was four hundred and seventy-six pounds, but two hundred and eighty pounds was all I had in hand. I wrote therefore a cheque for two hundred and eighty, though I would have gladly sent four hundred and seventy-six, yet felt thankful at the same time that I had this amount in hand for these brethren. Having written the cheque, as the last occupation of the day, then came my usual season for prayer, for the many things which I daily, by the help of God, bring before him. 
and then again I brought also the case of these preachers of the gospel before the Lord, and besought him that he would even now be pleased to give me yet a goodly sum for them, though there remained but three days to the close of our year. This being done, I went home about nine o'clock in the evening, and found there had arrived from a great distance one hundred pounds for missions, with a hundred pounds left at my disposal, and five pounds for myself. I took, therefore, the whole two hundred pounds for missions, and thus had four hundred and eighty pounds in hand to meet the four hundred and seventy-six pounds which I desired for this object. Those who know the blessedness of really trusting in God and getting help from Him, as in this case, in answer to prayer, will be able to enter into the spiritual enjoyment I had in the reception of that donation, in which both the answer to prayer was granted, and with it the great enjoyment of gladdening the hearts of many devoted servants of Christ. The Heart's Desire Given to Help Mission Work in China September the 30th, 1869 From Yorkshire, fifty pounds. Received also one thousand pounds today for the Lord's work in China. About this donation, it is especially to be noticed that for months it had been my earnest desire to do more than ever for kingdom work in China, and I had already taken steps to carry out this desire when this donation of one thousand pounds came to hand. This precious answer to prayer for means should be a particular encouragement to all who are engaged in the Lord's work, and who may need means for it. It proves afresh that, if our work is His work, and we honour Him by waiting upon and looking to Him for means, He will surely, in His own time and way, supply them. THE JOY OF ANSWERS TO PRAYER The joy which answers to prayer give cannot be described and the impetus which they afford to the spiritual life is exceedingly great. The experience of this happiness I desire for all my Christian readers. If you believe indeed in the Lord Jesus for the salvation of your soul, if you walk uprightly and do not regard iniquity in your heart, if you continue to wait patiently and believingly upon God, then answers will surely be given to your prayers. You may not be called upon to serve the Lord in the way the writer does, and therefore may never have answers to prayer respecting such things as are recorded here. But in your various circumstances, your family, your business, your profession, your church position, your labour for the Lord, etc., you may have answers as distinct as any here recorded. THE GREAT NEED OF BEING SAVED BY FAITH IN CHRIST JESUS Should this, however, be read by any who are not believers in the Lord Jesus, but who are going on in the carelessness or self-righteousness of their unrenewed hearts, then I would affectionately and solemnly beseech such, first of all to be reconciled to God by faith in the Lord Jesus. You are sinners. You deserve punishment. If you do not see this, ask God to show it unto you. Let this now be your first and especial prayer. Ask God also to enlighten you not merely concerning your state by nature, but especially to reveal the Lord Jesus to your heart. God sent him that he might bear the punishment due to us guilty sinners. God accepts the obedience and sufferings of the Lord Jesus in the room of those who depend upon him for the salvation of their souls. And the moment a sinner believes in the Lord Jesus, he obtains the forgiveness of all his sins. When thus he is reconciled to God by faith in the Lord Jesus, and has obtained the forgiveness of his sins, he has boldness to enter into the presence of God, to make known his requests unto him. And the more he is enabled to realize that his sins are forgiven, and that God, for Christ's sake, is well pleased with those who believe on him, the more ready he will be to come with all his wants, both temporal and spiritual, to his heavenly Father, that he may supply them. But as long as the consciousness of unpardoned guilt remains, so long shall we be kept at a distance from God, especially as it regards prayer. Therefore, dear reader, 
if you are an unforgiven sinner, let your first and especial prayer be that God would be pleased to reveal to your heart the Lord Jesus, his beloved Son. A Double Answer July the 25th, 1865 From the neighbourhood of London, one hundred pounds with the following letter. My dear sir, I believe that it is through the Lord's actings upon me that I enclose a cheque on the Bank of England, Western Branch, for one hundred pounds. I hope that your affairs are going on well. Yours in the Lord. This Christian gentleman, whom I have never seen, and who is engaged in a very large business in London, had sent me several times before a similar sum. A day or two before I received this last kind donation, I had asked the Lord that he would be pleased to influence the heart of this donor to help me again, which I had never done before regarding him. And thus I had the double answer to prayer, in that not only money came in, but money from him. The reader will now see the meaning in the donor's letter, when he wrote, I believe that it is through the Lord's actings upon me that I enclose you a cheque, etc. Verily it was the Lord who acted upon this gentleman to send me this sum. Perhaps the reader may think that, in acknowledging the receipt of the donation, I wrote to the donor what I have here stated. I did not. My reason for not doing so was, lest he should have thought I was in special need, and might have been thus influenced to send more. In truly knowing the Lord, in really relying upon Him and upon Him alone, there is no need of giving hints directly or indirectly, whereby individuals may be induced further to help. I might have written to the donor, as was indeed the case, I need a considerable sum day by day for the current expenses of the various objects of the institution, and also might have with truth told him at the time that I yet needed about twenty thousand pounds to enable me to meet all the expenses connected with the contemplated enlargement of the orphan work. But my practice is never allude to any of these things in my correspondence with donors. When the report is published, every one can see who has a desire to see how matters stand, and thus I leave things in the hands of God to speak for us to the hearts of his stewards. And this he does. Verily, we do not wait upon God in vain. Christians in Business January the 1st, 1869 From Scotland, fifty pounds for missions, twenty-five pounds for the circulation of the Holy Scriptures, and twenty-five pounds for the circulation of tracts. Received also from a considerable distance, ten pounds for these objects, with ten pounds for the orphans. About this latter donation, I make a few remarks. At the early part of the year 1868, a Christian businessman wrote to me for advice in his peculiar, difficult business affairs. His letter showed that he had a desire to walk in the ways of the Lord, and to carry on his business to the glory of God. But his circumstances were of the most trying character. I therefore wrote to him to come to Bristol, that I might be able to advise him. Accordingly he undertook the long journey, and I had an interview with him, through which I saw his most trying position in business. Having fully conversed with him, I gave him the following counsel. 1. That he should, day by day, expressly for the purpose, retire with his Christian wife, that they might unitedly spread their business difficulties before God in prayer and do this, if possible, twice a day. 2. That he should look out for answers to his prayers, and expect that God would help him. 3. That he should avoid all business trickeries, such as exposing for sale two or three articles marked below cost price, for the sake of attracting customers, because of its being unbecoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus to use such artifices and that, if he did so, he could not reckon on the blessing of God. 4. I advised him further to set apart, out of his profits, week by week, a certain portion for the work of God, whether his income was much or little, and use this income faithfully for the Lord. 
5. Lastly, I asked him to let me know, month after month, how the Lord dealt with him. The reader will feel interested to learn that from that time the Lord was pleased to prosper the business of this dear Christian brother, so that his returns from the 1st of March, 1868, up to March the 1st, 1869, were nine thousand one hundred and thirty eight pounds thirteen shillings and fivepence, while during the same period the previous year they had been only six thousand six hundred and nine pounds eighteen shillings and threepence, therefore two thousand five hundred and twenty eight pounds fifteen shillings and twopence more than the year before. When he sent me the donation above referred to, he also writes that he had been enabled to put aside during the previous year one hundred and twenty three pounds thirteen shillings and threepence for the work of God or the need of the poor. I have so fully dwelt on this because Christians in business may be benefited by it. Revival in the Orphan Houses In giving the statistics of the previous year, 1871-72, to 72, I referred already to the great spiritual blessing which it pleased the Lord to grant to the orphan work at the end of that year and the beginning of this. But as this is so deeply important a subject, I enter somewhat further and more fully into it here. It was stated before that the spiritual condition of the orphans generally gave to us great sorrow of heart, because there were so few comparatively among them who were in earnest about their souls, and resting on the atoning death of the Lord Jesus for salvation. This our sorrow led us to lay it on the whole staff of assistants, matrons and teachers, to seek earnestly the Lord's blessing on the souls of the children. This was done in our united prayer meetings, and I have reason to believe in secret also. And in answer to these, our secret and united prayers, in the year 1872, there were, as the result of this, more believers by far among the orphans than ever. On January the 8th, 1872, the Lord began to work among them, and this work was going on more or less afterwards. In the new orphan house number three, it showed itself least, till it pleased the Lord to lay his hand heavily on that house by the smallpox, and from that time the working of the Holy Spirit was felt in that house also, particularly in one department. At the end of July, 1872, I received the statements of all the matrons and teachers in the five houses, who reported to me that, after careful observation and conversation, they had good reason to believe that 729 of the orphans then under our care were believers in the Lord Jesus. This number of believing orphans is by far greater than ever we had, for which we adore and praise the Lord. See how the Lord overruled the great trial occasioned by the smallpox, and turned it into a great blessing. See also how, after so low a state comparatively, which led us to prayer, earnest prayer, the working of the Holy Spirit was more manifest than ever. Mr. Muller's Mission Tours In the year 1875, when seventy years of age, Mr. Muller was led to start on his missionary tours, and during the next twenty years preached to more than three million people in forty-two countries of the world. On August the 8th, 1882, Mr. Muller says, we began our ninth missionary tour. The first place at which I preached was Weymouth, where I spoke in public four times, from Weymouth we went, by way of Calais and Brussels, to Dusseldorf on the Rhine, where I preached many times, six years before. During this visit I spoke there in public eight times. Regarding my stay at Dusseldorf, for the encouragement of the reader, I relate the following circumstance. During our first visit to that city, in the year 1876, a godly city missionary came to me one day, greatly tried, because he had six sons, for whose conversion he had been praying many years, and yet they remained unconcerned about their souls, and he desired me to tell him what to do. My reply was, Continue to pray for your sons, and expect an answer to your prayer, and you will have to praise God. Now, 
when after six years I was again in the same city, this dear man came to me, and said he was surprised he had not seen before himself what he ought to do, and that he had resolved to take my advice, and more earnestly than ever give himself to prayer. Two months after he saw me, five of his six sons were converted within eight days, and have for six years now walked in the ways of the Lord, and he had hoped that the sixth son also was beginning to be concerned about his state before God. May the Christian reader be encouraged by this, should his prayers not at once be answered, and instead of ceasing to pray, wait upon God all the more earnestly and perseveringly, and expect answers to his petitions.'